Hi, Jason. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I know that your fund has been active all this time, even during the pandemics. But our audience does not know you. And our audience is quite international. And uh, they would like to know you and your fund better. Will you please take a couple minutes and introduce yourself and your fund? Sure, absolutely. So I'm Jason Palmer, and I'm with New Markets Venture Partners. We've been investing in education and workforce technology for almost 17 years now. And we focus on companies that have kind of a strong research backing, proof of efficacy. We've invested in 30 companies over the last 17 years, 15 successful exits, and we're known as an impact investor in the sense of we invest in things that improve educational outcomes for students, um, and also build sustainable, profitable businesses. So just to give you a sense, uh, we usually invest in companies with about 2 million in revenue, and then we grow those companies to 20 to 50 million in revenue, um, and our investors receive between two to four X return on our successful investments. We have four funds we've raised over the past 17 years, about $125 million in capital under management. Wow. When, uh, when I do um, seminars, so the audience usually asks me, like, Sasha, tell us what industries are dying as a result of a crisis and which industries uh, will become dominant players. And one of the industries I list uh, as um, companies emerging is in education. And, yeah. But you were saying that you started your fund some 17 years ago. And now, if we look at the most impactful industries that uh, really are shaping our lives, it's what? It's healthcare, like digital healthcare, it's yep. uh, education, <laughs> and yep. all kinds of e commerce. So tell me how you started that field, because now everybody wants to be in that field, right? So, <laughs> how did you start? How did you well, have that insight? Yeah, that's, I appreciate you asking that because it's kind of interesting. So I started three companies in the 1990s. I was an entrepreneur and two of the companies were successful, self-backed and then venture-backed. And then one of them was a giant failure. And after the third one was a failure, uh, $22 million in venture capital raised and we ended up selling the assets for just a million dollars. It was a very, very tough failure after two successes. Um, I, I did some soul searching. I actually traveled around the world to Japan and China and Alaska and thinking about what I want to do with the next phase of my life. I actually had lost all of my net worth from my first two businesses. And uh, I almost had done Teach for America, which is a big program in the United States to teach in, in impoverished schools uh, in 1993 when I started my first business. And I grew up in an education family and my father was a teacher who became a principal, became a superintendent. I used to go to board meetings with him and do kind of fancy presentations of how many students went to college and how our school district was getting better. And, uh, and I always had this passion for education, but I'd kind of chosen to go the other way and be an entrepreneur. And so I decided to focus the rest of my career on this intersection of education and entrepreneurship um, in 2001, actually, and that that has led to, you know, not just the new markets uh, fund, which we've done, but I also skipped over that I spent some time at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where I led higher education innovation, working directly with Bill and Melinda. Um, and over time, this has been kind of the area that new markets as a firm focuses on is helping our educational institutions transform and adapt to, you know, the digital world that we live in now. And so uh, this, is, this has been kind of the mission I've been on since 2001 after the failure of my third business, so. Huh. Well, you know, uh, looking back, uh, you, you probably, if somebody reads your bio, they'll say that you had an old plan. You couldn't <laughs> be planning the crisis, but now it is the field. So um, tell me please, what has changed in this field? Obviously, most of the stuff is online, yes. right? So when you invest in companies, 
what are your requirements? Does it have to be like top-notch technology? Does it all need to be online? Or what is it that you're looking for? When I understand that you need to have 2 million in, in sales, but other than that, what are your requirements? So it is education is a very nuanced, uh, multi-dimensional market. So we, we grade the companies that we look at on eight dimensions, many of which are similar to venture capital firms in other industries. So for example, we do look at the leadership of the firm. Do they have expertise and experience as leaders in that particular segment, in that particular area, which is really quite different because a leader in higher education is different than a leader in early childhood education. Um, and it's different if you're doing an academic solution or if you're doing an administrative solution. So there are a lot of like variables in there. We look at the total addressable market of the problem being solved. It really needs to be solving a major problem in education. There are a lot of point solutions in education and we steer away from those. We look for the companies that can become real platforms in education that can actually transform a whole sector and get to you know, very large sustainable revenue, $30 million or more is when they kind of graduate to the next level. A number of our companies have ended up being acquired or invested in by folks like Bain Capital or KKR or ETS or Instructure. These are publicly traded companies. Um, and so we build our companies to get built up to that next level and acquired by that next level. Um, so if they don't have the total addressable market or the ability to eventually be acquired by one of those bigger fish down the road, then they're not investable. But some of the unique attributes to the education market are the efficacy that I was mentioning before. Is the product strongly efficacious? Uh, does it actually have research backing or do they have partnerships with researchers who can do that third party research for continuous improvement? Um, Gross margins are super important and underappreciated in this market. Um, so we look for companies with gross margins between 60% and 90%, which is a little bit different than you would get in say an internet or a, a healthcare pharmaceutical investing market. Um, and then we also look for the product solution fit, which is in education, there are a lot of people who have created businesses that are like a silver bullet that are gonna sort of magically change education overnight and it doesn't really work that way. You have to fit into the workflow of either the teachers or the educators or the educational system. 80% of our companies have been what are considered B2B, sort of SaaS-like companies that are sold to colleges or school districts. And it's only very rare kind of special circumstances when a B2C company will work in education. And, and we know how to spot those too. So I kind of blurred a little bit of our eight principles in there, but I think you got the gist of it. Right, right. Well, usually uh, a bigger problem a company is trying to solve, the bigger the company becomes. Would yeah. you mention three major problems in education, which uh, some of your portfolio companies and maybe your future portfolio companies will be addressing? Sure. Three major so, problems in education. Yeah. When, when we got started back in, uh, you know, actually I'll even say just about a decade ago, most of our focus was on K-12 education and there's some well-known markers in K-12 education, which are still good to invest in, helping third grade literacy, middle school math fluency, do they graduate college and career ready? Um, over time, we've evolved to more post-secondary and worse force uh, sort of milestones that are good to invest in. For example, does this enable the student to get a credential in a very quick, efficient, cost-effective manner that helps them get a quality job, a $50,000 a year job or not? And so a lot of our higher ed and workforce investments are graded on that curve. How efficient are they at ROI to the actual student? And then the third area that I would cite would actually be kind of the uh, the finance portion of the education system. Education finance is complicated, but billions of dollars flow through it. And so we've invested in a company that processes billions of dollars of financial aid and allows students to know how much financial aid they will get in 48 hours. Whereas before it's kind of a FinTech company, before it would take, it still takes in many places, students one or two months to find out what your financial aid is. And that's, that's devastating. Imagine if you didn't know your credit when you were trying to buy a car, it would be, you, you couldn't wait one or two months. But that's the way it is in most of higher ed finance right now. And another one of our companies has partnered with Goldman Sachs 
to actually provide $100 million in loans for students to go to boot camps, because in the US, boot camps are quite a great way to get technology skills in six or 12 months much faster than a college degree. So we look to partner with blue chip partners that are bringing efficiency and ROI to the educational system. Mm -hmm. That sounds like you are the US uh, centric. You don't go outside or have you tried <laughs> going outside for companies? So we've invested in companies in India and China and my partners have experience investing in both Latin America and Europe. Um, and when I was, at, I was at Kaplan, the education company for a number of years, I helped run Kaplan Europe and also managed a company in India. Oh, Actually, managed, well. <laughs> and managed a company in Israel, come to think of it too. So we have a lot of international experience, but for the most part in the last decade, our investing has mostly been in the US. For, the, for our new fund, we're raising a new fund, 150 to $200 million fund. We're gonna have the ability to invest globally for the first time in a decade, and we're really excited about that. So would you think that then these issues are universal? It doesn't matter what country, when it comes to education, some basic issues are basic. And that's, I guess, what your companies are addressing, right? Or will there be a difference between um, the major problem in China or Israel, Brazil versus us here in the US? Why are they all the same? They, they are all related, but, but in a different way. So uh, how people learn, there's now a science of learning that's pretty well understood that I participate in a number of committees on. And so how the brain works and how we learn is quite similar if you're a human being, regardless of where you live. The way that education technology gets built to you know, work to strengthen brains and strengthen learning works the same way all around the world. But the distribution systems, how you sell and market your products and what those products do needs to be very different, even just between the US and Canada, let alone between China and Japan or India. So there's very different purchasing and distribution in every country. And uh, we, the only reason we're going international now is because we now see a number of our companies are starting to get 20, 30, 40% of their revenue internationally. And so finally, products built in one place are scaling across the globe in a way that didn't, it wasn't happening five years ago. Now products can be much more global than they used to be. And that's partly because of uh, uh, phones, uh, smartphones. Uh, widely available internet everywhere, um, and the fact that there's much greater ability to translate uh, and globalize products than there used to be just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us a little bit about your team. You're not um, a sole right. partner, right? So do you have co-founders? How big is your team? Who are they? Right. Yeah, so we have a seven-person team. Uh, my partners, Mark and Rob, co-founded the firm back in 2003. They've been investing together for even longer than I've been with them. They uh, used to work at New Enterprise Associates and the Calvert Group, which are two very large uh, and impact-oriented funds here in the US. Um, and we also have Juan Zavala, who came to us about a year ago. Juan used to work at Cambridge Associates and Sigler Guff. And he has background as a fund of funds manager, Wharton Business School. I know uh, all of them well. Yeah, wow. <laughs> that was a good, yeah. good, good background. Uh, mm -hmm. Jessica uh, comes from uh, Cape War Capital. She used to work at Cape War Capital and is currently MIT MBA program, who worked for us over the summer and will join full time once she graduates. Barbara has been our accountant since the beginning, almost since the beginning. She came on a couple of years in. And another one of our co-founders, Don Spiro, he actually uh, uh, is now 80 years old, was an Olympic rowing champion. He played a much more active role in the beginning days, but he still is kind of the soul and the backbone of the organization. He, uh, after founding a couple of businesses and taking one public, he actually uh, headed up the University of Maryland's Entrepreneurship Center. And this program was actually born out of a university or new markets. The firm was born out of the university when Don uh, first funded it back in 2003, sort of a funder sponsor and has remained with us ever since. Wow, what a team. And uh, uh, 
is it on purpose that you keep the size of a fund? Well, it, it it's a good size fund. But what I'm saying with a team like that and the markets you're addressing, why didn't you want to become a billion dollar fund? Why did you stay with the size? That's a good question. So it's mostly because we really think we are good at this invest in companies when they have about two to 5 million in revenue and grow them to 20 to 30 million. That's, that is our sweet spot. If you even go back to when Mark and Rob worked together uh, at NEA and, uh, and Templeton, uh, they actually, it was the same type of thing. They, they worked on investing in companies globally in Latin America and Europe, where you would take a privately run company with $2 million after the wall fell, say in Eastern Europe, and you would help professionalize it, grow it, turn it from kind of a one country, one region thing into a larger multi-country, multi, -country, multi -country. Yeah, Tell it to the next level. So it's it's about 80% of our successes have been in this, raise it from 2 million to 20 to 50 million and then sell the company to the next phase. That's our sweet spot. But we have had successes in some other areas too, um, which which are also interesting for a separate longer conversation. And my final question, if somebody wants um, say an investor who has made money in a different industry and they decide to invest in this ad tech mm -hmm. what is the best way to invest should they um, try and make direct investments should they invest in the fund specializing in it should they, they just join the group what is the best way from your perspective investing in ad tech <laughs> at this point i know for sure the best way so the best way is to invest in new markets or a fund like new markets that has multi-fund track record. So our last three funds are all top quartile, according to Cambridge Associates, in terms of the cash return to investors, DPI. We have a net 10.5% IRR over the last 12 years of track record. And... Um, and, but to also have a co-investment relationship with us. So to invest in our fund and then have a co-invest relationship where you can cherry pick the deals that are kind of most likely to be able to expand to your international geographic locale or that are the ones that you feel like you have the closest connection to, strongest passion for. Um, we have now seven LPs with both fund and co-invest relationships. And it's something we do, we do very well, so. What is the minimum check if somebody wants to become an LP, say, in your fund? Minimum check size is a million dollars to become part of the fund, and it's $10 million for co-invest relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not advertising anything, you know, with all those disclaimers, you know, we're not doing fundraising or anything about it, just for educational purposes only. Right, right. So that will be it. Oh. Okay, well, this sounds really, really interesting. And thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm looking forward to maybe potential joint projects. And we'll see you on our platform. And uh, this video fun. will be good. published in some social media. Nat Natalie will send you the links. Thank you so much, Jason. Nice great. meeting you. Great to spend time with you too. Bye. Bye.